Wherever there is life, there must be the condition for life where there couldn't be life. Agree? So, in the same way, so for a fish to live and exist, there must be sufficient water or a pool of water. Agree? So for the soul, okay. for the soul to live and exist, there must be sufficient pool of vitality. Soul food. <laughs> soul food. Chit lemon fried chicken. Greens. I know. I just thought I'd ask a couple of questions first. And another word. Playground. Are we moving toward the intelligence here? Is that what so, is about? See, in Plato and the Timaeus, the fundamental Latinus comes right out of the Timaeus. And in the Timaeus, um, Plato says, you know, you, you have to bring usia or uh, being, that special kind of being, the two kinds of being, of course that which is potentially divisible or distinguishable and one that is not and the combination of these two mixed right, produces soul. Now soul then is then dispersed throughout the universe. So that within it you can then locate planets. This is world soul. And would you not agree in the world soul there happens to be one we're familiar with? Earth. And there are kinds of things that live there that are said to have individual souls. That therefore, he has a problem, a continuous problem, and so does anyone who deals in this kind of thought. What is the relationship between this world soul and yours? The kind of life you have, which we can call the world of becoming, Earthborn, right, is not the same as the content of world soul. So therefore, he's got himself an interesting problem. And Plotinus now, what's the issue? He wants to say, that the problem we want to look at is the separation of the soul from the body. And if it has much of this experience,
what does it take along with it? Now remember the other part is that this soul is um, in the path of reincarnation. So, when you drop dead, uh, what are you going to carry with you into this realm between birth and death and reincarnation? These are the questions that he has to address. And when he's talking about here, our world, he's talking about sensation, perception, thinking, the intelligible, especially in respect to if you're going to carry it along, if there's anything carried along, you need some vehicle for that. And that's why he spends a great deal of time on the problem of memory. Because all of this, in some way, should be fed into, or is contained by, and there might be some <coughs> sorting out, screening, or discriminating. And therefore, as he looks at these things, how then do does this take place? And then he's got the parallel problem of <clears throat> so in this work he's coming out of two works, Plato's Timaeus and Homer's Odyssey. So I just thought I'd mm. Spend a moment on that, and then we go and do some reading and take a look. Fair enough? Great. <clears throat> okay. Here, in essence, the thing that we're talking about in and of itself is memory. And then we're going to look at the effect upon others that memory has in the dialectic outline of Proclus. And, and that is what Plotinus is going to do. Um, but the, okay. You may have, a, may have an additional question because Proclus says something different with memory. Well, no, I'm just using the dialectic uh, outline. That's okay, okay, but he does deal with memory in a different way. Yes, yes. So, okay. Okay, we're into the soul. And remember, I left you with a good... Hold it! It's just a... When you said um, for... You gave your list of what constitutes this world, and you gave sensation, perception, well, thinking... In the world, of, in our everyday world, world of becoming, it has to deal with sensation, perception, thinking, and the intelligible. And the intelligible is the contrast with the everyday world, or the intelligible is also in the everyday world? Well, I was hoping you didn't ask that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to be able to read what I write down and like grasp it, you know. He's going to do something very curious with this. Hmm. And, it, and the way these two are related in terms of memory is going to be hmm. central. So you're quite right to focus on that. So last time, agree, 
We made a couple of bold statements and said we would start out, we would be not. Just take a look at the first paragraph on 25. Let us now come to memory. Does it function in souls when they're departed from earth? Does it remain solely in some of them? If so, do the souls remember everything or only some things? Does memory exist forever or does it disappear a certain time after departure from the body? Okay, 27. Remember every time he uses the word, especially the capital letter, that's world soul. Small s, individual soul. All set? And remember, as you can remember, as Julie once said, behind every soul is a hill. <laughs> That's Julie. That would be Julie. I wanted to quote her. 27. But what of soul? Is it to soul, called the divine, called the soul divine, the one that essentially constitutes us? See? <clears throat> How is it related? How is it related? Here we have real soul. Right? Here we have real soul. How is it related to individual souls? Is our soul essentially world soul, only under certain conditions it takes on the particularity of individuals? What's the relationship between the two? Because each of them, and this is a key term that he's going to use again, I didn't put it here, but good time to, the problem of recollection. Now the Mino has shaped also a good part of his thinking. Is it to the soul, called the soul divine, the one that essentially constitutes us? Or is it to the other soul, that which comes to us from the cosmos? Each of them has recollections, of which some are proper to it, and others are held in common with the other soul. When these souls unite, they then have all the recollections at once. Why then separate each of them? Remaining alone possesses rather its own recollections, although it keeps for a time the recollections of the other. Now, here comes the Odyssey, okay? Central to the whole work. Such at least is the shade of Hercules, who is in Hades. This shade, one must, I believe, think of as recalling all the actions done during life, because this life pertains to it especially. Hey, we're introduced to another idea not just soul, but shade. Okay. 
in uh, in the Odyssey, uh, after death, what keeps all of the recollections and experiences of your life together exists exists in what we would call Hades. And over time, it diminishes. And over time, it diminishes. diminishes. And that's why uh, Tiresias was said to be a genius in the house of Hades, because he could recollect and recall all of his experiences, and therefore time did not have an effect upon him. All right, what is it? Then, to the degree then that the memories fade, so does the shade. In other words, if you want to make a kind of a popular term here, it's very much like a, a ghost. Right? The soul has, a, as it were, some kind of uh, collection of all of its experiences, and it endures as some kind of entity, but that entity finally expires over time. Therefore, the next problem he has, well, then what happens to the soul and how does it relate to the Hades? See, the, uh, um, when Odysseus goes into Hades, remember, all of the women, all the great women, parade one by one, and each of them tells him what it was that brought about their downfall how they were seduced and how they lost their honor in one way and the other. All of them, one by one, one. And when it's all over, his mother says, hey, you go back and you tell Penelope all this. So she becomes the heir of all the wisdom of Hades and all the women's experiences who have been treated unjustly. So it's a good book. I recommend it. <laughs> yeah, Homer. I don't know his first name. <laughs> but look it up on the web. So, back into it, okay? This shade, one must, I believe, think of as recalling all the actions done during life because this life pertains to it especially. The other souls constituting the composite being, however, would have nothing more to recount than the events of this earthly, right, this earthly life. For being of a composite, they would uh, know only these events and such as are touched upon justly, as touched upon justice. But Homer has not said what Hercules might be able to recount himself when separated from his shade. What would this godlike soul once completely freed of all of his past experiences. See the question? Good one? To the extent that it is under the attraction of earth, the soul recounts only what man has done or undergone. <clears throat> Time is far advanced and death at hand. It remembers its previous lives, even though some recollections have vanished through the lack of uh, appreciation. When free to the body, it will remember things it could not remember in its present life. And if it comes and goes in a new body, it will be able to recount the events of the life external to the body, those of the life it leaves, as well as the numerous events of previous lives. Uh, although, again, you know, with time it forgets. What will it recall once it's completely isolated? To know that, mm, we're going to have to first search out the faculty by which remembering is affected in the soul. Okay, now he's going to go into... Right, that's what we have to do. We have to review them. Now... Um, It's kind of interesting that uh, it's 
really a series of very interesting questions that he doesn't get to answer into, into section 29. So if you can move to 29 and we'll get someone to read, then I'll be able to sip my coffee while someone else works. Fair? I'll read. Oh, okay. okay. 29, okay. Are we then to attribute memory to the faculty of sense? Are we to say that memory and the faculty of sense are one and the same faculty? If, as we said, the shade of Hercules has memories, as does Hercules himself, it is because the sense faculty is twofold. Right, it's twofold. Hold on to that. Keep going. If memory is something different from sensibility, the remembering faculty is twofold. If memory is the faculty of sense, given there is a memory of scientific knowledge, it will be necessary that there be a sensation of this knowledge. But then it will be necessary that another faculty be related to both. Do we then suppose a common faculty of perception and attribute to it the memory of both sense objects and intelligible objects? If we perceive... Hey, is the same thing going to remember both or only one? Or do you need a different kind of faculty for one over the other? Now, just for shorthand, why don't we say, for those that were present during the dreams of Brad and Myra, that that experience could be counted as an experience into the intelligible. All right, just for the moment. Mm -hmm. Then he wants to know, is he going to remember that? Is what's going to remember at the same thing that remembers sensation? Mm -hmm. How accurate is it? Especially over time. Uh, what keeps it alive in either? See, that's the, these are his issues. Now, one more thing for him to remember. Here's Saul. And, uh, For Plotinus, the soul, a good part of the soul is already in the intelligible, and all it does is take the time to wake up to its reality, because it's already there. There's only a small part of it that is not. Sensation. And a certain kind of perception. And we want to know what happens then when the soul leaves the body. It enters into perhaps the intelligible and or Hades with the shades, and therefore he has to give an account of it, and that's where we are. Okay, jump ahead. Do we then suppose a common faculty of perception and, and attribute to it the memory of both sense objects and intelligible objects? If we perceive sense objects and intelligible objects by one and the same faculty, then that doubtless would be to say something. But if they are two, there would be no less than two memories. And if we attribute these two memories to each of the two levels of soul, then we would have four memories. Because they're two souls, world soul and individual soul. Yeah, we're gone. <laughs> but is it absolutely necessary that we remember objects of sense by the faculty by which we sense them? That sensation and its remembrance come from the same faculty? Is it necessary that the faculty by which we reflect be also that by which we remember our reflections? Key, key sentence. Those who reason best are not those who have the best memory. Woo! <laughs> See, we got an excuse. <laughs> he's gonna give he's gonna deal with that twice. Later he does it even more forcibly. Go ahead nor is there equal remembrance of equal sensations. Some people have clear perception, others have a good memory without clarity of perception. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, were memory distinct from the faculty of sense, since memory bears upon objects accorded previously by sensation, 
it must also sense the objects of which it will later have the recollection, must it not? There is nothing against their being for recall, an object sensed, that is, an image. And that memory and its retentive powers pertain to imagination. <clears throat> sensation culminates in imagination, and when the sensation is no longer, the culmination remains in the imagination. If then the image remains with the objects absent, there is already remembrance however short the time that it remains present. If it remains a very short time, memory is brief. If it lasts a longer time, memory is augmented because the imagination is the more robust. If the image changes with difficulty, memory is strong. So what do you have to do to have a good, a good memory of uh, things you experience? It should be augmented with imagination keeps it alive. Right. Memory of sense objects therefore pertains to the imagination. Because it must have imagination to keep it alive, therefore well, there must be a kinship between memory and the thing that keeps it alive, which is imagination. That's the way he reasons. As to the differences between memories, they come either from the intrinsic difference of these faculties, or from the way of using them, or from certain bodily constitutions that alter it and disturb it more or less. We will return later to this question. Okay. Now look here. 30 is a problem. It's a lot of fun, but you have to be careful. Let me s consider the problem. Okay, first, just for a moment. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, earlier over coffee, a number of us were talking, and uh, we all agreed to this. But, um, so, let me put it on the board. Now, when we were in the kitchen, everybody agreed that we should allow Barbara to have first shot at this. I don't And there was no objection to it at all. Would anybody object if Barbara gets most of the work to do on this? How many words would you say can be substituted for thought in 30? Let's get it called. Let's play together. How many words might you use that might substitute for the word thought? Memory? Right. Oh, idea. Idea? Concept. Concept? Yeah. He has known object. Did you have Would this word also be there inside? Mm -hmm. Idea, concept, uh, known object. <clears throat> Pardon? Uh, Consideration. Could intellect be one? Intellection. Is that an idea? What about intellecting? Or Intellection. Some translators have used to translate the word news, thought. Really? I think you're right. No, we'll write in the Parmenides fragment. Mm. Thought and the object of thought are the same. And it's news. Mm. So I'll, I'll put that in too, okay? Okay. What about logos? Hmm. Logos, okay. <clears throat> Reason. Because in this paragraph, he's using the word thought in many different ways. And David said he'd be free 
to explain those differences to us as soon as he got here and sat down. Oh, there he is. Yes, indeed. Did I bring the right book? Anybody bring the <laughs> low Latinus? I brought the wrong one today. Oh, then you can you can help us out with this on section 30. All right, that's great. And if you need help, you call on David, Barbara, and others. Right? Fair enough? <coughs> Ah, good. Then all we need then is someone else to read aloud as you read hello. And when you hit the word thought, you'll sneak over on the left-hand side and give us a word or two. Okay. Fair enough? Sure. Okay, 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 okay. okay. I'll read. Yeah. But Do you have your hand up? Okay. I had a girl in my class. She showed up and... Uh, She's really became quite brilliant, and uh, I asked her how you know to attribute her brilliance to what, and she said, "Well, um, I have a spasm, and uh, in class every time my hand went up, you called on me. So be careful when you wave your hand." You can read that. I'm, I'm good with that. Oh, it's okay. No, it's okay. Okay, let's go. Okay. So one of the remembering of intellectual concepts. Is there also an image of these concepts? If, as Aristotle said, an image accompanies every thought, the persistence of this image, which is like the reflection of the concept, would explain the remembrance of the known object. Otherwise, one must seek out something else. It is perhaps only because of the verbal formulation which accompanies thought that it pertains to imaginative perception. For thought is indivis indivisible, and so long as it is not expressed exteriorly, but remains within, it escapes us. Language in developing it and making it pass from the state of thought to that of image reflects the thought as in a mirror. And thus it is that thought is perceived, is made determinate, and is recalled. Whenever the soul is moved continually towards thought, it perceives it only if it is in the condition indicated. For it is one thing to think, it is another thing to perceive one's thought. We are always thinking, but we do not always perceive our thought because the object that subject that receives the thoughts receives also ultimately sensations. Now our object is to go back and to try to pull those threads together. And therefore you can also use your own experience. But first, what do you say? It's forms of noeo all the way through. They're forms of noeo all the way through. And therefore what would be a good word for him? Okay. Intellection. Intellection. So the whole thing could be intellection. The other way oh. is like okay. I said. No way. Could you give me a good example of intellection? Intellection. Perceiving all of the manifold parts of the universe united as one in the body of the God of Gods. Okay, everybody heard that? <laughs> no, I looked at it louder. Yeah, perceiving he said all... it was very much like Brad's dream and Myra's dream That's when right. they had that insight. Uh, yeah. too. <laughs> Is that too. what you said? I like that. Even better. Is that right? What are we going to call it? Intellecting. No, see? Or, uh... It's Intuition? Getting an insight into the nature of mind, into the intelligible. A vision of Intuition. ultimate reality. A vision of ultimate reality. A vision of the nature of ultimate reality. Right, 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 right. Okay, Th therefore, you see this word recollection and remembrance? That comes out of the, uh, me know. What does it take to awaken? Remembrance. Uh, 
Yeah. Holding on to a holding on to a question. You have to be stung. Yeah. Right? You have to be Sorry. Right. The question has to have you. phenomena. Right. Look here. See. This only takes place with the stingray. I have to be puzzled, right? Baffled. I do not know. Uh, bang. And Socrates and Amino says to Amino, hey, you think what you're in is something? He says, I am as puzzled as puzzled can be. So he has reached the bottom of puzzledom. And he lives in that state. Right? He's astonished by everything. Ah. That's remembering. That's, that's remembrance. That's remembrance. Two parts of remembrance. The stingray, and then out of the stingray, then there's nothing, no beliefs obscuring it. Then you can see this, that, and the other thing. Or whatever thing you're working on. But this is the study that needs to be cultivated, right? I don't know. Stand before the mystery of life and all existence. Right? That's the hint of your remembrance. The condition? Yes. It's the condition for it. That's the condition for it. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go back in it and let's see if we can piece it together. David, jump in. Well, I hate to be like premature here. Well, that's good. <laughs> but it just seems like this is like uh, the model of the, the eye that perceives. And the thing perceived, mm -hmm. and 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 uh, that um, that there's an intermediary there in this paragraph that you didn't you, you weren't speaking of. That uh, just like light is in perception, it seems like in the middle of this paragraph, it's absolutely necessary to have words so that the thing understood, the intelligible thing understood by the mind and remembered, it, in here it says it's, it's only through logos, or word, that, you know, in, when you have an eye and you perceive something, it needs life. But in this passage, it's saying how is something remembered in the intellect? Well, if it sees something, it's an image, and perhaps it was only because of the verbal formulation mm -hmm. which accompanies thought that it pertains to imaginative perception. For thought is indivisible, and so long as it is not expressed exteriorly, but remains within it, it escapes us. Language, in developing it, and in making it pass through the state of thought to that of image. It's the intermediary. From thought to image, you need language. And that's how you remember. So I hope something has something to add to that. So that's how whatever is going on gets puzzled. at this moment, right? Whatever he's calling thought. <clears throat> has no form. Mm -mm. It's indivisible. No. Then an intermediary comes in. <clears throat> Language. Look at that. What is the low state? In developing word? it, making Logos. it pass from the state of thought, <laughs> it then becomes an image. Like a dream. Reflects the thought as in a mirror. This reflects the thought as if in a mirror. And therefore there is, must always be a distortion. <clears throat> so we're making it determinate. See, we're making this 
determine it, we're fixing it through language, then we have an image. And sometimes it's as difficult as pulling teeth to get people to put words on it. Is that right, Brad? <laughs> Is that what we're trying, right? right. Yes. Right. Whenever the soul is moved continually towards thought, it perceives it only if it is in the condition indicated. Ah, you know, it's one thing to think, it's another thing to perceive one's thought for the most part. It doesn't pass through this medium and therefore it's gone. Would you not agree? It's going to make a big difference whether we're thinking of thought in our everyday world or if we're going to substitute this idea, intellection. And therefore, it's best to put brackets around that because it isn't merely a thought, because thought, merely a thought is already determinate it already has a form, and it already has an image connected with it, right? That's what he says earlier. Every thought has an image. That's the everyday thought. So here, this is the action of intellecting, noosing around. <laughs> Now, given this, he's now going to pull it together. He's going to say a couple of more words about it. Uh, but he doesn't add too much to it. But he wraps it up in 32. So why don't we give it a shot? Because this is where he brings it together. And again, we need a new reader. Don't want to overwork. Have you had your hand up before? Okay. Mm -hmm. Louder. How is their memory of friends, of children, of wife? How of fatherland and of all that an honorable man is able reasonably to recall? Good. Do it again. How is their memory of friends, of children, of wife? How of fatherland and of all that an honorable man is able reasonably to recall? So he's talking about for him. The honorable man, right? Mm -hmm. Living a purposeful life. Oh. And for him, that's Hercules. <coughs> okay, go ahead. The lower soul has a recollection accompanied with emotion. But man is able to remember without emotion. At the beginning, doubtless, the man feels emotion. Even the soul itself feels the most noble of these emotions because it has some relationship with the soul. <coughs> but it is fitting that the soul wish to act as the soul does and to remember as it does. Now, the especially little soul would like to remember as the big soul or the world soul. Go ahead. Especially is this so when it is itself refined. One becomes better through the education one receives from a higher being. Yet it is necessary that the soul be willing to forget that that which comes to it from the soul, the excellence of the higher is linked with a baseness in the lower. So, see, so it's, got, it's got two ranges of experience, doesn't it? Right? So, when you travel in after death, why do you say, you know what, there's something curious about this. Each individual's soul has a memory, and part is of sensation, perception, and memories of the everyday world. <coughs> and memories of the intelligent.
So he's saying, hey, you know what this does? Only takes part. Only takes this part. Doesn't accept this part. Huh? That's rather curious. Right. He better tell us what he means. Go ahead. The more it forces itself towards the intelligible realm, the more it forgets things here below. Now he's talking about back to the honorable man. Right. The more he starts dealing with the realm of the intelligible, hey, the more he forgets this world. Ah, there's a forgetfulness. Now he comes back with our good term we were looking for. It for forgetfulness occurs because his, his energy and interest is in the intelligible, therefore this weakens the, the, the great effort of imagination is no longer to keep this alive, but this. Mm. Ah, go ahead. Upon, let's see, uh, I, I drew, the, the, more yeah. the more it forces itself towards the intelligible realm, the more it forgets things here below, because it's life. Upon earth, it's not filled with the memories alone of the better things. For it is beautiful, for it is beautiful, here below, for it is beautiful here below, to withdraw oneself from the cares of men. It is necessary, consequently, to withdraw oneself from the memory of, each ca of such cares. In this sense, one can rightly say that the good soul is the forgetful soul. It takes flight from multiplicity, reduces the multiple to the one. Abandon, abandons the indeterminate. It does not take with it a mass of earthly memories. It is light, and it is wholly alone. Even in the present life, when it wishes to think and to be in the intelligible realm, it abandons to that end all things, all, in all things else. Very few memories of this earth accompany it into the intelligible realm. <clears throat> Less indeed than when it is only in the heavens. Okay, now he goes back to mm -hmm. Hercules. The Hercules of Hades is able still to speak of his bravery, but he esteems it a small thing now that he has passed into a region more sacred and has arrived in the intelligible realm. He is now endowed with a strength more than Herculean, for those battles which are the battles of the sages. For those battles which are the battles of the sages. Therefore, how important is the idea of the shades that he picks up from Homer? That's what maintains the memories. And whatever Hercules has discovered in the intelligible realm, that he takes with him. Well, no mortal man. No? No man would want to praise what he learned from an equal higher than what he could get <coughs> from the source of that equal. Mm -hmm. yeah. All men want to turn back yeah. and go to a higher. All souls want to revert. Sir Hercules is the guy. After Prometheus brings fire to man, Hercules is the person who can turn back and love the good that begat him. And loses, yeah. but finds less important to recall, <clears throat> and therefore he's only taking, really, the higher part of his journey. Yeah. Just like the soul doesn't want to learn from soul. Yeah. And this part goes on as a shade. Yeah. Curious? Well, that's what you get for when you buy a book like this. So, uh, did you just say that? Did you just say that her, a part of Hercules exists as a as a ghost? Why are you asking? Well, there's two parts. No. Uh, if I just understood. because it seems to me you recollected it very well. <laughs> that that upon his so upon his. Uh, 
his death, there is a part of him that, that stays as a, as a ghost of memories and the uh, other part is carried on to the intelligible? You, you recall very well. Oh, I, I've never heard that before. That's all. Well, that's what you can get for how much you pay uh, for the book? I don't know. See? Yeah. Now, see, he's picking up. He's, he's, a, he's Homeric. Right. And in Homer, um, the, the, what is recalled from the earthly existence diminishes over time. And therefore, some are just fleeting, having very little substance left. It's always forgotten. But the soul journeys ahead of it into the intelligible, to the degree that is able to have experienced the intelligible. Curious work? Good. No, 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 no. And now, and in the intelligible, he's stronger, stronger than himself. Louder, please, for everyone. Well, he's now endowed with a strength more than Herculean. So he's stronger than himself in the yeah. intelligible. Yeah, that's right. For those battles which are the battles of the sages. No, no. No. <clears throat> what a guy. Good. Well, that's mine. <laughs> No, that, no, it's yours. I think it's mine. Yeah, okay. So what next? The battles of the sages. Interesting dialogue. Friendship. We'll do that next time. Mm -hmm. It's a short one. Oh, yeah. It's only 2,854 pages. Oh. Barring an error in calculation. It's a very fine dialogue. Very interesting. It has a dialectical feature worth grasping. Oh. So, anyone, let's talk about this. Any, anything that comes up for you? How come it's always the same shit? How come it is always the same? Shit. That? That the greater powers give birth to lesser powers and the lesser powers want to turn back and love the greater powers. Because it wants that's, you to remember. That's Plotinus. That's not Plato, that's Plotinus. That sounds like Proclus too, though. Uh, parts of it. But he's still, see Proclus, Proclus deals much more with uh, the myth of error. Hmm. And Plotinus does not. But is that on the... Uh, where? Where the Hercules thing comes in? Or with the myth of error equaling Hercules? Yeah, he, he doesn't deal with the myth of error in this. There are several things he doesn't deal with. This is one of them. And he also doesn't deal with the myth at the end of the Phaedo. And, uh, see, for Plato, uh, see, there's a feature to this that uh, is very strongly expressed in the Phaedrus to account for the incarnation. And for him, he says, uh, that everybody after death journeys in the heavens. And then there's the cry, let's have and join the banquet of the gods. And they all rush up to the banquet. And there's all kinds of competition and fury and all kinds of our souls can't make it. They're injured and they're rushed to the banquet hall. And then he has to explain why it is. And he says, well, the reason people have a problem is because there is no learning, only experiencing in the next world. Weird. You take what you have and you play it out in the next world. 
the next world being the, the world of the divine or the yeah, world of the, rebirth? The soul, let's just call it the soul's journey. The soul's journey. Right. And uh, to explain the, the fact that some do and some do not, they don't learn anything there about that. They just play out what it is they have learned. And he says, the reason there is such a variation is because in the past it is through bad communication. And of course that's in the Phaedrus because the worst kind of communication is the Lyceus speech that Phaedrus had under his cloak and wanted to uh, practice his memory on Socrates and he said, Fui, I want you to read it, don't practice on my ears. But that's an example of the worst kind of communication. And therefore the other extreme is his second speech. The rhetoric so and stylistics. Yeah, 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 this is the worst rhetoric. And then he's going to show the art of rhetoric in the philosophical sense as the highest. So the degree to which one can learn, they take whatever they have learned with them. That accounts for the rise and fall of souls in their journey in the next world. That's not Plotinus. He doesn't deal with that. What, what dialogue is it where he, the whole second half of the dialogue is an analysis of rhetoric? Yeah. Is that the Phaedrus? No, the, it's the fourth part of the dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, we never, and we never read that, do we? Oh, magnificent speech. We, we never do read Let's do it after Lysis. Nice. <laughs> now remember, if we're going to get into that, our good friend Proclus has that beautiful description in his metaphysics, where he understands and takes apart that myth. The yeah, whole architecture and what it means. Oh, we got to do that too. Where is that? I told you. Oh, okay. Did not? Excuse me. The uh, Theology of Plato. Oh, okay. Good. Oops. Didn't catch that. No. Yeah. That's right. Uh, and if you want to know some people who've gone through it, yeah. Mark. Okay. Believe me, I know. Don't we, David? We know Mark went hey, through it, don't we? I was sleeping when we went through it twice, and he was there the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Not sleeping the night. <laughs> okay, should we do that? Can I, or then we'll do the Phaedrus after? Yeah. Even though we've done the Phaedrus before. Okay. Lysias done Phaedrus. Yeah, we didn't spend enough time on it. Now that, when you get into Phaedrus, that means you're really going to have to really enjoy getting into the three speeches and show why they exist and the relationship between them, right? I mean, how about the introduction of the setting? Oh, the introduction is beautiful. Okay, he'll... <laughs> Egmar has agreed to master the introduction and help us with any questions. Good man. And the setting. Right? Good man. No, no. And the second part. The setting. Ooh, and the, and the art of rhetoric? Yes. Oh. That's a really a very splendid section on the art of rhetoric. Oh, uh, yeah. And, Nancy, wouldn't you agree that someone who's done their homework in Greek should be able to be good at explaining that section on rhetoric, the art of rhetoric, since it deals so much with Greek? Yes. You think that would be fair? Oh, oh yes. And She'd argue with her. She said yes. He can call on colleagues. Yes, you can call on Okay, how about that? Oh, it reminds me of that part of the Phaedrus where he talks about to tell what the soul really is would be a matter of super, superhuman <laughs> discourse. Okay. okay. I mean, that section on rhetoric is pretty robust. No, and it's very many distinctions. Yeah. Many, many distinctions. And we want to know whether or not Socrates' speech contains those distinctions. In other words, can we turn it upon itself? That would be splendid. Okay. We're free early tonight.